so in the last class we had taken an example where there was an existing uh, drug with a cure rate say 0 0.6 and uh, there is a new drug which is proposed and uh, that is tested on a sample of 20 patients and the question to uh, verify or the, the hypothesis to verify is whether the new drug has a better success rate than 0 0.6. So the so called null hypothesis H0 is that P which is the unknown probability of success for the new drug is less than 0 0.6, less than or equal to 0 0.6 that means the new drug is not better and the alternate hypothesis is that the new drug is better. So to, to overturn the existing status quo which is a null hypothesis you need strong evidence and so the, the chance of making that type 1 error which is of rejecting the null hypothesis mistakenly that should be controlled because we do not want to unnecessarily change to a new drug which is not significantly better. So the test statistic is x the number of successes out of 20 and the suggested test region is that if x is significantly more than 12, 12 is equal to the old drug. So if it is significantly more than that then we are not likely to make a mistake of rejecting the, the existing drug uh, very casually. So we will, we will reduce our chance of making an error of judgment in reducing the uh, in uh, rejecting the null hypothesis. So the suggested rejection regions are of the type x is greater than or 15, 18, 14 like that. So we can plot the rejection possibilities suppose p is equal to 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 like that. In fact we can plot it for p less than 0.6 also. So that turns out to be this sort of curve. So this curve plots the rejection probability suppose p is equal to some value. So even if p is a small value like 0 0.3, 0 0.4 by chance you could get 18 successes out of 20 that is possible. It is a very small probability but it is non-zero right. So you see what I am saying right. So p is say 0 0.3 that means it is actually only 30 percent chance that a given patient is, is going to be cured. If we take 20 patients then actually we expect only about on average 6 patients to be cured. But by chance it could happen that a very large number of patients is cured like 15 or something. It is it's possible, binomial probabilities will give you that. So there is a small chance that even for p equal to 0 0.3 we will reject the null hypothesis meaning we will mistakenly say that the, that the new drug is better because we get more than 14 or more than 15 successes. So that probability is what is being plotted here. So the probability of rejection of the null hypothesis is for different values of p. So as, as p increases these probabilities of rejection of the null hypothesis they increase and asymptotically grow, go to 1. As p is small they all go to 0. So it is asymptotically going to 0 on one side, asymptotically going to 1 on the other side. It is an increasing curve, it is a continuous curve. So it is going to be this S shape thing. So that you can show actually analytically one can show that this is going to be the. Uh, so what you should see is the, the nature of this curve as, as the rejection region changes. So as x is 14, 15, 18 the, the, the rejection criterion grows tighter and tighter so the curve moves to the right. That means for the same value of p the rejection probability is less because the criterion is stronger and stronger. If I want to reject only if I get 18 or more then I am for the same value of p. I am less likely to reject it than for you know x greater than or equal to 15 or so for different rejection regions defined by x greater than or equal to 14, x greater than or equal to 15 and like that the different curves can be plotted. So those, those curves are called the operating characteristic or rather this is the power curve uh, the 1 minus this is the operating characteristic. So this power curve is the rejection probability which is this S shaped curve which as the rejection region becomes tighter and tighter moves to the right. So this is what I had told you verbally and which I have added in the uh, notes put up that th this is the way the uh, curves behave. So you should check your, your intuition and your uh, understanding of this by, by looking at this uh, qualitative nature of the, of the curve. So any questions about this part? So this was the binomial probability hypothesis test regarding success probability of, of a given um, experiment. So where you repeat 
that that experiment and uh, you expect a certain behavior based on that behavior you you define a rejection region and uh, based on that one can compute the type 1 error which is the probability of uh, rejecting it rejecting the null hypothesis mistakenly which is always possible but we want to put a bound on that so that is the type 1 error which uh, we want to control in the design of the test so any questions about this yes no 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 It, it's small p only. It's the it's the unknown value of p. For different values, we can we can imagine what will x be. Okay, we can see see for a given value of p, say say point seven. What will x can take on different values with different probabilities. X is the number of successes out of twenty, with p equal to point seven, the chance of an individual success. So one can compute the binomial probability distribution for the chance that one will get 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 successes. That cumulative probability is plotted for a given value of p. Okay, that tells me how likely am I to reject the null hypothesis for a given value of p. So, for example, for for p equal to 0 0.6. Which is the extreme case where the uh, the new drug is actually same as the old drug? It is no better actually. Then also, I will get some value of alpha, which is this probability of rejection, and that is the type one error. That means even though the new drug is no better, I am still going to reject the null hypothesis with that probability. So that it it whatever it is, it is, it may be point zero five or whatever the value is in in this or point one say. That means with a ten percent chance. Even though the new drug is as good as the old drug, no better, I am going to conclude that the new drug is better than the, the old drug and therefore reject the null hypothesis that the old drug is actually. Uh, so, that chance is what is being plotted here. So, based on our judgment, we can then see whether this test is good enough to discriminate the new drug from the old drug. So, if I want to be really sure that I accept the new drug only when it is really better, then I make the rejection region tighter in this case maybe make it x greater or equal to 18 in which case for a given value of p there is only a small chance that i will make a erroneous conclusion so as you can see for the the blue curve on the extreme right is for x greater or equal to 18 so for p equal to 0 0.6 there is only a very small probability that i'll make a mistake and accept uh, i mean uh, reject the null hypothesis so the, in this case, my my type one error will be very very small. So I'm very conservative. I'm not going to throw out the old drug unless I have really strong evidence. So uh, th that depends on the judgment. So for example, you know, if I'm the drug controller of India and I, I, you know, it's already established in all sorts of public distribution system and people have confidence in it and so on. I don't want to just uh, based on a few trials just conclude that something is better. So I I say you know I I want to have only a one percent chance of making an error of that type. So I, my my significance level alpha of the type one error is uh, you know one uh, percent. Then I'll appropriately decide the uh, the rejection region for the test. So rejection remain, remember is for rejection of the null hypothesis. Null hypothesis in this case is that p is equal to p is less than or equal to 0.6. That means the the new drug is is no better than the old drug. Okay. So please please just. Uh, Go to write down the binomial expression and verify that you can even plot it. Actually, you can use Scilab or you can you yourself plot plot the nature of this curve and verify that, that it is of this type. And qualitative nature of this curve, you should be able to reconcile with uh, these points. Okay, that all the curves are asymptotically of this type; they are all continuous, and the curve shifts to the right for different types of regions. And what is the uh, interpretation of the type one error and type two error in in this curve? So this you should uh, try to uh, see. The other thing which we did was testing for means of normal populations with known variances. So supposing we, uh, so this again a uh, two minute recap of what we did last time and then I want to continue. Supposing we, we have a sample of size n with a known variance. That means the causes of variation are, are diagnosed from, from uh, earlier experiments because they are more to do with environmental factors. Whereas the mean is the particular setting in a, in a given run 
of the, of the process let us say. So, I am let us say I am testing you know uh, the uh, dimension of, uh, of a manufactured product through setting of the equipment. The variability in the, in the dimension is because of you know inherent characteristics of the machine and the environmental conditions and, and uh, other structural features, but the mean the, the setting is operator dependent day to day it changes it depends on the tool and so on. So, that is what I want to control from day to day variance also I am interested in, but let us say that is more stable over a period of time it, de it depends on the process which I have selected. So, that that does not change. So, for known variance, but unknown mean. So, so there is a certain uh, context in which these type of uh, hypothesis tests are done. So, you might wonder what is this known variance, but unknown mean, but so this is an example of what I am saying that variance is the characteristic of uh, a process once it is designed and it is uh, uh, in, in many cases the, the causes of variability are statistically known and they, they are uh, they are not something that we can control or something that is we, we take it for granted and we quantify it and it is known as sigma square. The mean of the process is something that it is in our control and we would like to set it, but because of differences in the uh, either the skill level or the, the particular setting on that day it could vary. Now, now, when we observe something, we, we do not know whether it is because the mean has shifted or the mean is different from what we think it is or it is because of the variance. Okay? So, supposing somebody tells me that this, this set of values comes from mean 50 and variance 5 and therefore, there is a certain spread around 50. I do not know if that is the case or it is really mean 52 and variance something because I'll, I will see some, some variability around 50 some of the values will be more, some will be less, but you know maybe the mean has actually shifted. So, I would like to be able to distinguish these two cases, where the set of values that I see is actually because of shift in the mean rather than the inherent variability which is sigma square which I already know. Okay? So, the, the way the question is posed is the null hypothesis is that the mean is mu naught which is some known value which is uh, uh, told from before and h1 is that the alternate hypothesis the mean has shifted to some other value mu naught, mu naught is a specified constant. So, what you know if you observe a sample of size n then and if you take the sample mean which is x 1 plus x 2 plus x n divided by n, you would expect that value to be close to mu naught if indeed the null hypothesis is true. If, if the sample mean is different from mu naught then you would suspect that the process has shifted that is the collision mean is not mu naught, but something else. Okay? So, you look at the sample mean x bar and you look at mu naught, if they are very close to each other you say well it looks like the mean is really mu naught, if, it, if they are different then you say that look, uh, because you know we know that if, if I take a sample of size n and I let that sample size go to infinity or take a large number of samples, if the mean is really mu naught then I expect that x bar to be very close to mu naught right because the laws of sampling that you know laws of large numbers I expect that if I take larger and larger samples although there is a variance mu sigma square if I take a large enough sample the sample mean will be close to the true mean. So, if the true mean is indeed mu naught then the sample mean will be close to the true mean. So, x bar I expect it to be mu naught. So, x bar minus mu naught in absolute value will tell me whether it is really uh, the, the true mean is in fact mu naught or something else. So, x bar will not be exactly equal to mu naught, but it should be close to mu naught. So, the question we are trying to ask is how far away from mu naught should x bar be before we start to get worried. So, if x bar is only slightly away from mu naught, we will say okay, this is because of sampling. I have only taken n samples after all and there is an inherent variable variability sigma square. So, x bar cannot be expected to be exactly equal to mu naught, it will be close to mu naught. In fact, we can write a distribution right of x bar. If, if the sample is normal, then x bar also has got a normal distribution with a known parameter. So, we know that there is going to be some variability in x bar. You, you see what I am saying right. So, I am drawing samples from normal distribution with mean mu naught. Let us say it is really mu naught, it is, it is no different from mu naught and the variance is sigma square. So, if I draw a sample I am not going to get value mu naught, I am going to get something centered around mu naught, but could be more or less. 
if I take 2, 3, 4 n samples and I take the mean of that, then I expect to get close to mu naught because some will be more than mu naught, some will be less than mu naught, averaging out it should come close to mu naught, right. So, but still it may not be exactly equal to mu naught. By chance, you know, if I take a sample of 10 values, maybe 6 are slightly more and 4 are slightly less. So, I get on average a slightly more, it could happen. So, how much is that slightly more before I should start get worried? start to get worried that the mean has actually shifted. It is not mu naught, but it is actually mu naught plus something. So that is the question. Is the question clear at least? Okay. So what we see is that, so this is what I said that why is uh, this uh, type of uh, experiment done. So the, the critical region for rejection of the null hypothesis. So we want to, at some point we want to conclude that the null hypothesis is not true. That means mu is not equal to mu naught. The process should be stopped the operator should be uh, told to take take measurements and calibrate the process again, reset the machine and so on. Now, you realize that that is going to be an expensive and time consuming and uh, unnecessary cost for uh, quality. I mean, you sort of stop the, stop the line, so to speak. So, you do not want to do it very, uh, you know, uh, uh, just based on uh, some hunch or something. So, you want to do it based on some qu quantitative uh, criterion. So, the, the criterion is that if x bar, which is the sample mean of a sample of n, if that x bar is different from mu naught significantly, that means x bar minus mu naught is bigger than c, in x bar minus mu naught could be more or less, I mean could be greater than or, equal, or less than 0, but significantly away from 0 by at least c, then we say that the mean has shifted. Okay. So, what is that C? That is, that is what has to be designed. So, if that C is very small, then we are going to stop the process every now and then and uh, you know, uh, we are going to incur that cost, so to speak. So, if C is very small, then you know, I am willing to take a chance that the process has actually shifted when it has not. So, it is like that cry wolf story where uh, you know, you raise false alarms and say that the mean has shifted and actually go and see it and nothing has happened. It is mean is in fact mu naught what you see is inherent variability. But if C is very large, then you are very, very conservative. You do not you don't reject the null hypothesis till the, the mean is sh significantly shifted. So, definitely you do not make that error of stopping the process unnecessarily, but you may make the other type of error, which is that you know the mean is shifted, but you are not you are not reacting to it. Okay? So, there is, there is a balance which you have to strike. The way of doing it traditionally is that you, you put a bound on the type 1 error and within that you make the, the acceptance region, I mean the rejection region as tight as possible. So, you say that I want to mistakenly stop the process no more than 5 percent of the time. If this, if this thing happens repeatedly, I will be wrong some of the time. So, I, I say that I do not want to be wrong more than 5 percent of the time. So, then C is chosen appropriately. So, for that, the quantitative basis for that is that x bar is of a known distribution. X bar which is a sample mean is has a known distribution. So, we know that uh, X bar is a normally distributed random variable with mean mu and variance sigma square by, by n. So, the statement that X bar minus mu is greater than in absolute value greater than C with a certain probability equal to alpha which is my type 1 error that can be written in terms of the distribution of the no standard normal random variable because we know that X bar has a known distribution. So, X bar has distribution normally distributed with mean mu and variance sigma square by n. So, x bar minus mu has got you know mean 0 and variance sigma square by n. So, x bar minus mu divided by sigma square by n has got variance 1 and mean 0. So, we can write it in terms of the standard normal random variable for which we have tables and all those things. So, x bar is normal with mean mu and sigma mu naught and, and uh, uh, variance sigma square by n. So, we can construct a standard normal random variable. So, from that we know what is the chance that that standard, random, that standard normal random variable will be greater than C. Of course, since we are taking absolute value, it, 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 it could be greater than C or less than C in, in absolute value. So, we write it as absolute value of Z is greater than C. So, we, we put put that alpha or our significance level on both sides of the error. So, this is the, this turns out to be the criterion. So, C is chosen such that 
probability that the standard normal random variable is greater than c root n by sigma, that probability is equal to alpha by 2. So, in this alpha is known, sigma is known, n is known, the sample size is known, c is chosen so that this is true. So, that will give me a test which will make a type 1 error no more than alpha percent of the time. Is that okay? So, in this in this setting, we know what is uh, n, our sample size, we know what is alpha, which is our significance level, that is our subjective level of comfort, and we know what is sigma from, from prior experiments. We have to select c, so that this is true. Okay? So, uh, you, you can compute this and you, it turns out to be uh, c is equal to sigma z alpha by 2 divided by root n. So, small z alpha by 2 is the the point in the distribution of the standard normal random variable, so that alpha by 2 is the area on the right hand side of the curve. So, the cumulative distribution that uh, uh, standard normal random variable, so that the area to the right of that is alpha by 2. So, we can write it in terms of the original statistic. So, here is the example that supposing I, I, I see uh, signals drawn from what is supposed to be mu is equal to 8. and uh, variance equal to 4, sigma square equal to 4, and by chance I, I take five, 5 signals, because each signal takes me time to measure and te takes me effort to measure. So, I observe 5 signals and sample mean turns out to be 9.5, where the true mean is, so sub, somebody is saying that you know, the, we are in fact nowadays we are talking about you know these uh, uh, radiations from these cell phone towers and things like that. So, somebody claims that in, in appropriate units it is 8, but you know there are variations. So, the variance is 4. I take 5 signals and take the average and it turns out to be 9.5. Then I start to get worried that you know maybe it is not 8, maybe it is actually 9 or, or, or more. That person is trying to convince me that it is actually 8, but you know there is variability of to the extent of 4, the variance. So, that therefore, you have seen 9.5. So, should I believe that person or not? That is the, that's the query. So, I have taken five, 5 samples, they could be anything, but the mean is 9.5. Okay? And I have to accept or reject the claim that the true mean is, is 8 with variance 4. So, is the variance enough to explain what I observe? Of course, it is possible with, with mean 8 and, and variance 4, by chance I could get 5 readings all above 8 and the mean could be 9.5, of course, it is possible, but you know maybe it is a bit unlikely. In fact, supposing I get x bar equal to 10, 11, 12, it is still possible, but more and more unlikely. So, when is that time when I should really get worried? That is the nature of the question. So, here the null hypothesis is mu not equal to 8, alternate hypothesis mu not not equal to 8, and we chose say 5 percent level of significance. We construct the test statistic, and here in this case, we, we compute the, the, the test statistic and we check that 9.5 mean from 5 samples is, is okay. I mean, it could happen. So, that is what this, this compute, computation tells me. So, H naught is not rejected. So, that person is okay in claiming that the mean is actually 8, but. So, if I got the same 9.5 with, with, with 100 readings instead of 5 readings, then I would say, look, this is uh, stretching things too far. I could get 9.5 even though the mean is 8, but it is highly unlikely. So, you can see that as, as n, n changes for the same mean reading, the, the, the test would be rejected. Here it is accepted. Is that okay? So, please see this example and similar examples are there in the textbook. So, the p value is what I said last time also that uh, this is not very important, it is just that it is it's a language used by practitioners so that that significance level you know need not be told up front. So, it, it sort of tells you, you know, supposing I get a very small p value, then you know it is very unlikely that the null hypothesis is true. So, this p value is something that uh, it is used in the uh, practitioner's uh, world uh, just to say, so it is it it's the sort of highest alpha value which would be accepted. So, the p value of the test is the chance of rejection of the null hypothesis. So, that means if, if, if the p value is in this case. Uh, in is uh, 0 
then you know any confidence level below this would be would be okay for the test that means somebody who is likely to make even a 50% error uh, would uh, uh, would use this data to to reject the null hypothesis that is too uh, too loose i mean so we would, we would not have uh, uh, that much uh, faith in our test so if the p value is large it means the null hypothesis is likely to be true if the p value is small it means the null hypothesis is likely to be uh, false so without having to specify the uh, the confidence level uh, up front okay so uh, now going ahead uh, this was still uh, what i did up to last time so if i want to test now a one sided hypothesis that means the the uh, often you know we are interested in questions not whether mu is equal to mu not or mu not equal to mu not 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 that type of question but whether mu is say greater than mu not so supposing we are interested in these type of questions so so for example supposing somebody comes and tells you that the the amount of preservatives in this uh, uh, food item is less than or equal to some value you are okay with that versus the the conclusion that it is more than that now if it is something less than that then you are okay so you are not you are not so concerned about exactly pinning it down to a value mu not you are interested in just looking at the conclusions mu less than or equal to mu not versus mu greater than mu not okay so again you will do the same thing you will check x bar minus mu not but in this case supposing x bar minus mu not is a uh, positive then get worried so reject h not this is h not x bar minus mu not is less than 0 then okay earlier we had you know looked at the absolute value of x bar minus mu not here we are only interested in x bar minus mu not in sign so x bar minus mu not greater than 0 that is the one that we want to use to reject the null hypothesis we don't want to use either greater than 0 or less than 0 we want to use only greater than 0 so it's a one sided test so the test has to be appropriately designed so that we only look at that probability so in the in the earlier case we had we had said that x bar should be equal to mu not so x bar can be different from mu not either on one side or the other side so the cumulative probability of that happening had to be controlled here it's only one side the probability has to be controlled okay so here the test statistic is x bar minus mu so we reject this so actually this absolute value should not be here so that is the that is the point here so this this test this this t if it is greater than or equal to minus z alpha then we reject it otherwise we accept it so the the summary of this is given in in ross's book actually that h not if it is the equality hypothesis that mu is equal to mu not then uh, the null hypothesis mu mu not equal to mu not then this is the part that we have done where the test statistic is this and uh, where we reject the null hypothesis if the absolute value of the test statistic is greater than z alpha by 2 so there we we it, we could be greater or less with uh, with some probability so that alpha by 2 shows up in in the case of one sided hypothesis that is mu less than or equal to mu not or mu greater than or equal to mu not either it's a sort of symmetric argument then the appropriate null hypothesis is mu is less than or equal to mu not then the alternate hypothesis is mu greater than mu not then the test statistic is the same but there we look at just the value of the test statistic and it should be greater than z alpha so z alpha is the the point in the standard normal where the 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 uh, area to the right of it is uh, equal to alpha the significance level so with that probability we will be in that rejection region and therefore make a mistake so that's what we want to control so in in all these uh, computations the the sample is of size n drawn from a sample uh, drawn from a population with mean mu and and variance sigma square where sigma square is known and the test statistic is derived from x bar which is the sample mean and because we know that the sample mean has got a distribution uh, with mean mu and variance sigma square by n 
we are able to const we are able to construct the test statistic standardized normal random variable test statistic which is root n by sigma into x bar minus mu so x bar minus mu x bar minus mu not divided by sigma by root n is standard normal so that is the test statistic and if if that is some extreme value then we reject the null hypothesis okay so uh, just to uh, give an example of this so people are claiming that uh, you know average life span is increasing so some time back say in, in some some community uh, the average life span was 70 somebody is claiming that it is more than 70 now okay so they have taken 100 sample and at the time of death what was the age of the person and computed that it it is 71.8 so is that enough evidence to conclude that the average life span has actually gone up so we know from a long history that there is variability in life span there is a variability and that variability is standard deviation 8.9 okay so in a sample of 100 i have observed a mean life of 71.8 is that explained by inherent variability of 8.9 years over 70 life span or does it mean that actually the life span average has gone up from 70 to something more than 70 so the null hypothesis is that mu is equal to 70 and the alternate hypothesis is mu greater than 70 what we have observed is 100 sample mean sample mean equal to 71.8 sigma from past experience is known to be 8.9 so do we have enough evidence to overturn the null hypothesis which is that the that the average life span has not increased it is equal to 70 okay so we construct the test statistic which is x bar minus mu not divided by sigma by root n so that is in this case 71.8 minus 70 divided by sigma is 8.9 and the sample size is 100 so root 100 so that turns out to be whatever it is and so that is 2.02 i think in this case so we look at what is the chance that we will get this 2.02 from a standard normal random variable from a standard i mean from mean 0 we see that that's quite unlikely so we we actually compute that z uh, z subscript 0.05 and that is 1.645 so this is in fact to the right of that so we reject the null hypothesis so actually the p value for this which is uh, uh, computed here is 0.0217 so actually we it's 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 even at a 0.02% level of significance which is that you know the chance of making a mistake is is only 0.02 uh, this this data would have been convincing enough okay so that's the type of uh, argument that we uh, do in this hypothesis testing so an extension of this which you would have seen in the case of confidence intervals also is the case of unknown variance so this is a natural extension where we we look at some data which is assumed to be normally distributed and we we have a hypothesis about the mean but in this case we don't know the variance we don't know the variance up front then then what do we do well we use the same data to estimate the variance i mean that's really all that we can do so in the earlier case we had we had assumed that the variance is known from a long history of past data in this case the variance is not known so of course we have to assume something about the variance because there is inherent variability that much we know so the natural device left to us is to estimate the variance from the given population so we just uh, the rejection region when when the variance was known is x bar minus mu not divided by sigma by root n and whether that was greater than or equal to some value derived from the confidence level I mean significance level. In this case, we don't know the variance, so we estimate it. So, what is the estimate of the variance from a sample? It's the so-called sample variance, which is this quantity s square. This you have seen, right? So, if I have a sample of n, then the estimate of the variance, population variance, is this so-called sample variance, which is this quantity divided by n minus one. you would have seen this before so please just revise your uh, uh, knowledge of this and uh, i mean we have discussed this i mean i i remember 
uh, there has been some discussion on this why this is n minus 1 and not n. I, I hope you have uh, noted this point and uh, basically it is because of the fact that uh, if I am using the same population to estimate the variance, then my estimate of the mean so that I can do this variance calculation is drawn from the same set of values. So, it is it tends to be biased towards that set of values which I have drawn. So, if I divide by n I sort of underestimate the true variance. So, that correction is made I have to I have to uh, divide by n minus 1. Of course, as n goes large it, it does not make too much of a difference really speaking, but it turns out that this quantity divided by n, n minus 1 is the unbiased estimator for the population variance. Is that okay? So, uh, we just uh, use the same logic x bar minus mu naught divided by s instead of sigma square we, we have this s sample variance divided by root n. But in this case this this quantity is not a normally distributed one it has got this so called t distribution. So, everybody is familiar with this t distribution right. So, this t distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. So, this test statistic x bar minus mu naught divided by s by by root n for a sample of size n is a known distribution. It is not the normal distribution, but something close to the normal distribution. It has got the same symmetric shape, but it is slightly slightly different. As n grows large, it it approaches the normal distribution. So, for, for large n you can even just use normal distribution it is ok, but for small size samples this this may be worth worrying about. So, that uh, t distribution is there. So, x bar minus mu naught divided by s by root n is again a known distribution. The only thing is that for different values of n this has got a different distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. So, this if you have to have the t tables for different values of n which is called the degrees of freedom. So, that, that using those tables we know the distribution of this quantity. So, we know the probabilities that this quantity is greater than or equal to something. So, using this we can quantify our, our error in, in coming to a conclusion. Hypothesis testing we come to a certain conclusion either we re reject the null hypothesis or we accept it. Because we are doing it based on this known distribution I mean a quantity with a known distribution we know what is the chance of that happening that that value taking on a certain that random variable taking on a certain value we know the probability of that. So, therefore, we we know the chance of making a mistake even when the null hypothesis is true. So, that is the type 1 error right. So, the t distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom is used to quantify the rejection region and its probabilities. So, here we know that uh, you know from the t distribution tables with with given degrees of freedom we can define t alpha n minus 1 such that probability that something is greater than the, uh, the given uh, uh, I mean uh, T value, T value is uh, I mean standardized T statistic is greater than or equal to T alpha minus 1 that that probability is equal to alpha which is the uh, our chance of making that mistake. So, for the test with level of significance alpha T should be large enough. So, that this quantity is is uh, has is greater than T alpha by 2 n minus 1 with equal to alpha. So, uh, that T small t is chosen with uh, uh, so that this is true. So, it is it is the same type of logic that we uh, used earlier. This is the t distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. This can take on extreme values even when you know this is supposed to be centered at mu and with a certain uh, shape of this uh, probability curve it can take on extreme values it can lie in this region or in this re region and since this is a symmetric thing this probability is alpha by 2 this probability is alpha by 2. So, even though the null hypothesis is true mu is equal to mu naught we could still get extreme values and therefore, reject the null hypothesis ok. So, even though mu is equal to mu naught by bad luck we could wind up here or here suppose mu is not equal to mu naught mu is here then this the, these values are quite likely, but even with mu equal to mu naught we could wind off far away from mu naught that can happen with some probability. So, I put those probabilities on both sides and therefore, I, I then I define my rejection region 
okay so so the rejection region is in terms of the test statistic root n x bar minus mu not divided by s or in other words x bar minus mu not divided by its variance which is s by root n only since this variance is estimated from from the sample itself this has got a t distribution so if if this quantity in the absolute value is large then i reject that means x not i mean mu not equal to mu not because otherwise i, exp I expect x bar to be equal to mu not so it's the same same thing as what we did earlier except that here we are using s to ex estimate sigma square and uh, so we are making that making use of the t distribution instead of the uh, normal standard normal distribution so the rejection region is that this absolute value of this is bigger than a t alpha by 2 for the one sided test it's the same thing but now we'll put we just look at uh, x bar minus mu not not absolute value for the for the one sided case where we are testing where uh, mu is greater than mu not versus mu less than or equal to mu not then uh, the rejection region is x bar minus mu not divided by s by root n is greater than t alpha with n minus 1 degrees of freedom so here's the example an agency has published figures on the annual number of kilowatt hours expended by various home appliances and it is claimed that the average is uh, 46 kilowatt hours i take a random sample of 12 and uh, you you get an average of uh, 42 uh, and uh, you know that has got a standard deviation the sample that i have taken has got a standard deviation of 11.9 then uh, is that enough to conclude that the vacuum cleaners that is the devices expend on average less than 46 Okay. So, here is a one sided test where somebody is claiming that these devices are energy efficient and they are consuming less than uh, this thing, but inherently there is some variability. So, is this enough evidence for me to accept the claim? So, the, the null hypothesis is that uh, mu is 46 or greater than or equal to 46 and the alternate hypothesis is that it is less than 46. So, I have got x bar as 42 but it is from a small sample of size 12 and there is an inherent variability of uh, uh, something which I do not know, but I, from the same sample I can estimate that there it, it is variable. So, I estimate sigma square from the sample. You got the question right. So, the, the default claim is that 46 is the energy consumption. I, I take a sample of 12 and I find an average of 42 and in that sample itself there is a variability some are more than 46, some are less than 46, average is 42. And I, from my sample itself, I know that there is inherent variability and uh, the, the uh, standard deviation of that is uh, 11.9. So, given that there is so much variability and I have taken only sam a small sample of 12, is it enough to conclude that it is indeed, the, the mean consumption is indeed less than 46? That is the question. So, I, I construct the statistics for statistic 42 minus 46 divided by 11.9 which is the standard deviation of the sample divided by root 12 which is the size of the sample that turns out to be minus 1.16 the table t value for 0 0.5 0 0.05 that is 5 5 percent level of significance for 11 degrees of freedom is 1 point minus 1.796. So, in this case the, the, the null hypothesis is not rejected because the, the inherent variability is so much that uh, I could have got 42 just by chance. So, it is not enough evidence that it is significantly less than 46. So, in this case, I, I would not reject the null hypothesis because if I want to make only a 5 percent error that I am going to accept the null, I mean reject the null hypothesis, then this is not strong enough evidence. Okay. So, I, the, the thing to do in this is uh, you know just try the try the examples in the book and try one or two more examples and convince yourself that what is really happening here and for the same example it would be a good good thing if you can play around with the parameters of interest that means that if the same data was 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 given to you but not from 12 readings but from 100 readings then what conclusion you would come if the same data was presented to you but your significance level was not 5% but 1% or 10% then what conclusion you would come to if the same data was given, but the sigma was different, then what conclusion you would come to? If sigma is more or less, if you try these things and you are comfortable with it, then the job is done. 
So, in this example, for if what would happen if the significance level was not 5 percent, but 1 percent or 20 percent or something. If the significance level is increased, that supposing I make it 50 percent, significance level is 50 percent, which is not really meaningful, but just for argument's sake. That means, I am willing to make a 50 percent chance that I, I am in error. Then this looks like good enough evidence. I am, I am below 42, I am below 46 anyway. So, I would accept it. But if I want to be conservative and not not throw out the null hypothesis unnecessarily, then in this case, because of the sigma, why, why have I rejected it? Why have I continued to accept the null hypothesis even though the mean is less than 46? It is because the variance is so high that it well could be a 46, but with variance that mean even with the size of sample, even with the sample of size 12, I, I got something less than 46. It is to this extent. So, if the variance was not so high, if the variance was not so high, this would be fairly convincing evidence. I have taken 12 samples, I have got 42 instead of 46 and the variance is not that high, then I would accept it. I mean I would, I mean I would accept the claim that the, the mean is less than 46, right. But in this case, the variance is so high 11.9 that uh, the, this could well be by chance. The mean is not really uh, shifted that at least I am not able to conclude the mean has shifted. Is that okay? Uh, anyway, so uh, the the other part which is there in in, in the book is uh, section 8.4, which is testing the equality of means of two normal populations. You people have done this in confidence intervals, right? That uh, you have two two populations, and uh, you want to test the means uh, whether they are equal or not, or you know the difference of means. Write a confidence interval for that. Anyway, this is uh, section point section 8.4 uh, is uh, is actually quite straightforward. It's this sort of situation. I have uh, uh, two populations, say x1 to xn and y1 to ym, and uh, I'm uh, again. You know, we have to distinguish the cases of known variance and unknown variance. In the case of known variance you know I am doing testing in different conditions uh, where the variance is supposed to supposedly known only the, the means are different. So, again I am I am testing two different sets of data and the, the question is whether they are resulting essentially in the same mean or, or different mean. So, it is like saying one process is better than the other, but for both of them I am gathering data. Okay, so, supposing somebody says that the performance of this uh, equipment is better than the performance of that equipment. So, under standardized test condition where the variability is the same and known. Okay. So, I, I gather data regarding the first set of equipment performance and I gather data regarding the second set of equipment and that performance. So, the x 1 to x n is the data for the first set and x y 1 to y m, m could be different from n because you know the conditions could be different. So, I am able to gather say 10 data points for the first uh, set and 8 data points from the second set because each experiment costs time and money. Okay. So, I, I will x 1 to x n has got inherent variability they are slightly different and they have got some mean and they have got some the known variance. Okay. Y 1 to y m again has got some variability, it has got some mean and has got some variance. So, I can compute x bar and I can compute y bar. Okay. So, if 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 mu x which is the real mean of the x process is the same as the real mean of the y process, then you know I expect I ex I expect x bar and y bar to be the same. Okay. So, I, I can construct the test statistic. Is the question clear to you? I mean the answer is okay, but is the is the question clear to you that the, the unknown mean of the first process is mu x and the unknown mean of the second process is, is mu y. So, the, the null hypothesis is that these two are the same. Okay. So, what do I do? I, I estimate x, mu x by x, I mean this is what I expect and y bar is mu y. So, if these two are equal 
I expect x bar minus y bar to be something close to zero. Okay, so you can you can show that I mean x bar minus y bar is actually normally distributed with mu x minus mu mu y and sort of weighted of the two populations. If this is equal to zero, then x bar minus y bar should be zero mean and with some variance. So I compute x bar and y bar from actual data and see whether it is close to zero. If it is different from zero, then mu x is not likely to be equal to mu y. So I construct a test statistic. So the test statistic This is the test statistic x bar minus y bar which is expected to be with mean 0 and with some variance. That variance since I am getting is a combined thing from, from two, uh, two samples it is sort of weighted some of that. So this quantity in absolute value if it is large then I get worried. So in absolute value if this is uh, bigger than z alpha by 2 then I I conclude that mu, mu x is not equal to mu y. Okay. So it, it's similar to what we did earlier, except that here you know you are looking at the difference of these two uh, means, which you expect to be zero. So x bar minus y bar, if it is equal to zero, then you know you you have sort of you are fairly confident that mu x equal to mu y, because x bar is an estimate of mu x, y bar is an estimate of mu y. So if x if mu x is not equal to mu y, then you expect x bar to be different from y bar. So x bar and y bar, if they are significantly different, then you you will conclude that mu x is not equal to mu y. But in the actual data that you get, x bar and y bar could be slightly different and could be explained by the inherent variance. So that variance is sigma x square and sigma y square and drawn from samples of size n and size m. So it turns out that this is the expression for scaling that x bar minus y bar quantity to explain the inherent variance. So divide by the inherent variance, that quantity is a standardized normal random variable. So it turns out that this quantity written here is a standard normal 0, 1 random variable. So, so this will have some, some inherent variability. If this is large, then the thing that I have seen is not explained by the inherent variability. It is in fact because of mu x not equal to mu y. If this is small, then you know what I have seen is is quite likely from the inherent variability. So mu x is in fact equal to mu y, but there are small differences in x bar and y bar. So it is not enough for me to get worried about it. Is that okay? So if mu x is equal to mu y, then x bar will be very close to y bar. That's fine. If mu x equal to mu y, even then x bar could be slightly different from y bar to some extent as given by the standard normal variable with, with this with zero mean and this variability. So, so this quantifies how much of variability I can expect by chance, not because mu x is not equal to mu y, but by chance. If mu x is not equal to mu, mu y, then this quantity is going to be large anyway, because x bar itself is going to be different from y bar. Because x bar is an estimate of mu x, y bar is an estimate of y, mu y. So then this quantity is going to be large. Even if mu x equal to mu y, there is going to be some variability. So this tells you how much is that variability that I can expect by chance. So this guides me how to come to a conclusion to separate the statistical part of the thing from the shift of the mean. So this, this also examples are there in the, in the book, it's a very, very standard type of examples. And again the same thing, if, if these means are known and the means are not, I mean so variances are known and variances are unknown. So the, 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 so this is in section 8.4 of the book, uh, please see that as well. So about, about, about hypothesis testing, this is all that I wanted to do. So the next two classes will be on regression models, which is sections 
9.1 to 9.3 and and 9.5 in process book so the next two classes will be on regression models okay okay thanks